paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Today we have a big shoe, as Ed Sullivan would say. For those who don't remember Ed Sullivan, he looked like he had been embalmed three days earlier. He was affectionately known as Knight of the Living Ed. So back to the big shoe. Today we have Christian Hansen and Zach Trites. They're the makers of a smash hit on Netflix, American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders, which delves into the mysterious death of investigative journalist Danny Casalero who met his demise in a hotel bathtub in Martinsburg, West Virginia in 1991. Casalero has become a folk legend, and many questions have persisted about his life and death over the last 30 years, until Christian and Zach decided to plunge into the rabbit hole. How are you guys doing today? Excellent. Thanks so much, Nick. Thanks so much, Nick. I was really impressed with... American Conspiracy. American Conspiracy and Chaos are a couple of things that the mainstream media has turned out that actually go pretty deep into uh, the, the clandestine. And uh, you guys uh, pulled off something pretty amazing. Thank you. Yeah, Chaos by Tom O'Neill is, uh, and the Franklin scandal as well were, um, you know, huge works and huge inspirations to, to us. I know the guy fairly well who wrote the Franklin scandal. He's a little unstable, but um, I'll, I'll tell him that you guys thought so. Thank you. So Christian got into Danny Casalero. He jumped in. Tell us about how you got into Danny Casalero and when you got into Danny Casalero. So I, I had a, a, a pretty uh, a fulfilling, um, interesting career as a photojournalist in New York City. Um, I was also a college dropout. So I went back to college after about three years of photographing in, in New York and um, ended up taking a, an investigative journalism class. And in the class, I uh, decided I was writing a piece about the role of money in politics. You had the whole semester to investigate this paper on this theme. And uh, I ended up choosing the private prison industry through like a series of other coincidences and um, realized that there was a company called Whack and Hut that was one of the most, the biggest players in the private prison scene and started looking into this company's past. It was founded by an FBI agent. Um, the board of directors were all department heads of intelligence agencies. They had offices all over the world during the eighties, um, little like private army uh, SWAT uh, paramilitary troops, um, also guarded malls and banks, you know, like small time. Um, and they were, uh, had formed a joint venture. I learned in my research with a native American reservation in the Coachella Valley to develop, um, you know, biological weapons, submachine guns, night vision goggles, and, um, for, uh, uh, right wing, um, guerrilla armies in Central America. And Danny Casalero had been r studying and investigating that relationship between Wack and Hut and the Cabazons. And so that's how I discovered um, discovered Danny Casalero. He struck me as a interesting, uh, eclectic, uh, creative guy who was working on a just mind-boggling, bizarre book that was... Uh, it was briefly described in, in newspaper and magazine accounts of his death, contemporaneous accounts, uh, as tying up a case called Inslaw, which I'd never heard of, the October Surprise, the Iran-Contra affair, the savings and loan crisis, the BCCI scandal, et cetera, et cetera, into this like, thesis called The Octopus. And I'm just like, 
what you know why have i never heard of this guy this book sounds amazing i've never heard of any of these scandals or i'd heard of them i didn't know anything about them and uh so yeah i just i, I thought that i wanted to read a book about him i did read two other books about him i still had questions so i was like all right fine like if no one else is gonna do this thing all the way i guess i'm gonna do it so how long had you been spelunking before that started before? in 20 either late 2011 or early 2012 and then your good friend zach he kind of thinks you're losing it and then you guys ultimately team up when when was that well I mean, Christian and I, we grew up together, so we just talk about whatever's going on in each other's lives. And um, he had been telling me about this story for a long time, and I was approaching it as a sounding board and an outsider. <clears throat> so he would always give good feedback. You know, I'd I'd hit, I'd come down a new road, or a, you know, a new, you know, using the cave analogy, like I find a new section of cave and tell Zach all about it. And he'd ask really good questions and, you know, just really good, give good feedback or, you know, just great sounding board, smart guy. Yeah. And so my feedback was usually, are you sure you sound crazy? This is too much. Yeah. Things like that. Um, but eventually, you know, it, it, it got a little bit weird in some, some respects. And then once you look into it though, it's hard not to take some of this stuff seriously. And, and where we really started, making a movie we didn't even really know we were doing this at the time a documentary but christian told me that one of danny's key sources and somebody he had been corresponding with michael reconosciuto was getting out of prison in 2017 and that's that's where we actually started filming things even though that kind of happens later in our timeline of the movie that's where it started for us together so would you say your addiction started in 2017 zach's yeah, my, my relationship to actually doing anything, and 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 we didn't, re we just did it because I told, as I told Christian at the time, you know, whether you want to make a book or a movie or whatever you want to do with what what you've been up to for the last five years, um, we will regret it forever if we don't just go out there and meet him and pick him up from prison if we have the opportunity and we and we don't take it. So there was no grand design, there was no big outline or like this is how we're going to do it. We just went out there, spent a day with. Michael uh, was one of this uh, kind of most interesting and strangest days of my life. I've never been involved with investigative reporting, um, whistleblowers, um, anybody who's anywhere, prisoners, uh, any, anybody who's anywhere close to what Michael is. And, um, and that started us on a, on a really long and twisted journey. The docuseries starts out. Christian's talking to a de detective that worked on this, and he says, you're going to get yourself killed. How did you feel at that point, Christian? Um, people actually say that to us and me a lot. Um, and or they, what, what they mostly they usually say, be careful, you know, a lot. And the, the implication being you could get yourself hurt or killed. Um, and, you know, I don't know. It's like, yeah, of course. I mean, okay, I'm not, what am I going to do? Not be careful. I mean, I'm being as, you know, I'm being careful. I'm not going to stop, but I'm being, I'm being careful. Um, you know, one, one source told me I needed to get uh, this certain type of plutonium tip bullet and a certain <laughs> adapter for a pistol. Um, and he said he would actually mail me all the parts. Um, and, you know, you just, these are some bad boys you gotta you gotta have heat and i'm like you know i'm not carrying a gun in new york or you know i am if you're a bad guy i am carrying a gun um so, <laughs> tip bullets and... tip bullets have, yeah. you, have you ever shot in a pistol before either one of you yeah we're good shots good shots good yeah we both are yeah we're from kentucky we know how to shoot oh guns. okay say no more uh, right. but you know you've been followed by people who are tailing you and 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 giving you weird phone calls thankfully uh, whatever th danger i've been in has been abstract yeah with franklin it was a little different with Casalero and then the octopus it's primarily uh cia malfeasance th that we generally expect the cia to be malfeasant in 
And with Franklin, I think it's different because it, it involves the trafficking of children like Epstein. And yeah, that that's something that this rogue element of intelligence definitely wants to keep under wraps. But Danny Casalero started out looking into Promise Software. Promise Software was developed by Bill Hamilton, who had a company named Inslaw. And the Department of Justice just decided not to pay Bill Hamilton anymore for Inslaw. And Danny Casalero started to look into that. And then that led him to the mysterious John Nichols. Right. Via a, a whistleblower um, named Michael Riconosciuto, who had who Bill had tracked down. You know, basically he had won his first two. He had won his his battle with the Justice Department in federal bankruptcy court. The judge ruled that the Justice Department stole the software using trickery, fraud and deceit. Then that ruling was upheld in an appeals court. And um, and so as the and the Justice Department appealed again, and as that case was going, was getting up, up and running, that's when um, a mutual friend of Danny and Bill's put them in touch. Danny and Bill Hamilton had a mutual friend. And uh, and so Danny went and met with Bill to figure out, you know, maybe he could write like something because he had because Danny had a background in writing about computer contracts of all things, uh, for a trade publication that he published. And so, about about three yeah. months earlier, Michael Riconosciuto had told Bill the seek, the reason why there was so much secrecy and cover up surrounding the uh, attempt to bank the bankrupt his the Justice Department's attempt to bankrupt his company. So then we have uh, John Nichols, and he oversees a number of dirty deeds in Indigo. California at the Cabazon Indian Reservation. Tell us a little bit about John Nichols. Zach, you want to take this? I'll take it. Yeah. So <clears throat> John Nichols, we could basically spend the next 10 hours talking about. So I'll try to keep it short. Um, from, from our research, and, you know, we're looking at it 30, 40 years later, and we're also looking at it through Danny's eyes, but we have the benefit of, of time. And the benefit, uh, one big benefit is talking to John Nichols, one of his sons, uh, Bobby Nichols, who we interviewed and who gave us a lot of interesting um, documents about his father as well. Um, and, and, and he was willing to talk to us, as Christian says, I think because um, he was just as curious about his dad as we were. He, he, he was out there at Cabazon with his father, his entire family. Um, he was out. At, so, so essentially John Nichols was a guy really briefly who, um, had been a brewer in Milwaukee in the fifties, um, then started working with the Teamsters and Jimmy Hoffa, um, eventually was in Washington, DC. He got in some sort of trouble with federal law enforcement. <clears throat> he moved to Brazil in the late fifties, right before the, uh, coup d'etat there, um, then he was back in the States. Then he goes to Chile. He's there briefly before, actually for a while as an organizer of um, kind of indigenous and, and rural people. Um, may, may, I guess rural peasant Chileans. Populations, yeah. To, uh, in a largely Catholic country, he was organizing them into um, uh, uh, Protestant groups. Evangelical. Which were which were turned into voting blocks um, to prevent Allende's uh, rise to power there. Um, he left Chile. There was it's kind of right before uh, Allende was taken out of power. Um, and murdered. Yeah. Got him. Yeah. You know, depending on your view of it. Um, <clears throat> so he was, what we found in our, in our, in our thing was that he was just going around the world, just all over the world, not just South America, not just Central America, all over the world. Um, and he he happened to be in a lot of places right before there was a right wing coup that was supported by the U.S. government, namely the CIA. But uh, also like right or like we're very fascinated by his t tenure in Lexington, Kentucky, where which was like a hub of M MK Ultra um, uh, research. We haven't been able to tie him to it yet, um, but it, it is compelling, like. Anyways, a lot of like, you know, with 
the guy had a very interesting, very interesting uh, life. So, yes. Yeah, so he was uh, a world traveler who happened to be in a lot of different places that the CIA was active. And then um, he landed in this mental health facility that he was running in, in Lexington, Kentucky. He was a grant writer and a social worker. And he said he was a doctor. And it depended on what you asked him, he was a doctor. And it was either a divinity, if he wanted to impress you on a on a on his bona fides in the re religious world or uh, in psychiatric social work. He also said um, <clears throat> there's a con artist aspect of what John Nichols is as well. So you can, it was a mail in doctorate. Ah, right. I um, should get one of those. Yeah. yeah maybe a Dr. Pod. Nick Bryant. Sounds good. <laughs> that, so, I like that ring. You can change the, maybe the podcast. Um, so by 19, by the late 1970s, he ends up at this small Native American reservation in the Coachella Valley outside of Palm Springs. Um, in, it's in Indio, California. Indio now is a pretty lively, booming place where like the Coachella Music Festival happens, things like that. But back then it was a tiny desert kind of, uh, I mean, I don't want to say wasteland, but there was, there was not much running water or anything like that. He finds this tribe, the Cabazons. Who uh, it was, like, it was a fork in two interstates, you know, in the middle of the desert. Yeah, in the middle of the desert. Um, and they, well, they, they, depending on who, how you say it, but essentially, he he links up with them, and he's there. They ask him to be a grant writer to bring some money, federal money, into the tribe, and he's like, "Oh, absolutely, I can do that." But his way of doing that turns out to be a little bit different than I think most grant writers would say. So he starts. Um, a plan to to do tax free cigarettes, sell tax free cigarettes and tax free alcohol, um, with the understanding that, uh, or the theory that this is a sovereign tribe, and that whatever happens on tribal land is no business of California state, and it's and it really functions like its own quasi autonomous country, um, through tribal sovereignty, and so our part of our documentary, you kind of see the evolution of that idea as it goes from cigarettes to alcohol to gambling. And this became much more important later in the 80s when this tribe essentially created modern Indian gaming law by suing the state of California and taking the Supreme Court. We don't go into that because it's so it's, there's so much going on in this documentary. But then also within so this theory of sovereignty, it takes a hard you might say a hard right turn towards supplying um, the, uh, you know, quote unquote, freedom wars, uh, proxy wars that we were waging in Central and South America, mainly Central America, supplying, creating weapons for uh, right wing armies uh, <laughs> to fight communism. Um, and so, the, you know, <clears throat> with his seeming background and in intelligence, he and grant writing and this whole hodgepodge of, of of connections that he has, he teams up with this company, Wacken Hut, which Christian had talked about earlier, which has all of these kind of three-letter agency um, people associated with it. And they're going to start this weapons joint venture out on this tiny desert land. Um, That's inhabited by 26 Native Americans. Yeah. <laughs> 26, 27, 27. Um, depending on the year uh, <laughs> and members, I guess you would say the caps on band of at that time, mission Indians now Kawia Indians. Um, and only like nine of those are adults. Like, it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's not that many people there and they're going to be, I mean, we don't even go into some of the, the, they had plans to be in charge of like the Saudi Royal families, palaces and, you know, um, just all kinds of weird security ventures. But what we focus in on is there, there's a um, triple homicide that happens sort of early in his tenure while he's in the middle of kicking all these people out of the tribe, establishing his power, consolidating that power within the tribe um, and building this weapons um, business. And then one of the tribe members who comes up to oppose him with some of the other uh, former members including the former head of the tribe who he had kicked out. Um, that tribe member, Fred Alvarez, two of his friends are found uh, shot to death with a bullet, one bullet in each of their heads at his house. And Alvarez on, is shot in the head too. 
Yeah, yeah, they all are. Yeah. Alvarez, uh, right. Patty Castro, Ralph Boger, Patty and Patty and Ralph were not tribal members. They were just friends of his. Friends of his. Kind of outlaw motorcyclist kind of guy, big like tough football player, um, a bit of a weed head. As but but also here. like a part of the um, you know Native American movement of the '60s and '70s to take power back and you know. Uh, he was also part of that scene. Written a letter to Ronald Reagan some at some point. Uh, <laughs> I th I think about his struggles with uh, with what was going on at the tribe. Um, interestingly enough, it seems like John Philip Nichols, who was then the tribal administrator, was uh, very much on Reagan's side of these contra wars. So that might have not worked out so well. The thing with Alvira is, is he went to a, an, an attorney and said, I want to get these guys kicked off the reservation. And, and the attorney said, well, you, you got to give me some documentation that they've been malfeasant. And he was digging around and he found that uh, he found the grand prize. The government wanted to make chemical and biological weapons on the reservation. And he also told the local newspaper, the Indio Daily News, that um he was had been threatened and he was worried for his life and that was a cover story of on the indian daily news a few weeks or a week before he was murdered well, i i think in reality it it didn't get published because it was so it was right before he right. got murdered. and right. so they actually once he was killed they had to say like, oh, a few days ago, this guy came in and said that he was going to be killed. And here he is. Um, dead. And, and we actually have the tapes from that interview in the in the series. So you hear Fred in his own voice, like talking about his concerns that, you know, that days he, he had days before he got killed. And it's interesting, the Alvarez family felt that absolutely that Nichols was responsible for the triple homicide. Yeah. And then a guy named Jimmy Hughes, who, who was the head of security at the uh, reservations casino, walked into a DA's office one day and confessed to being a bag man for Nichols and the Alvarez assassins. He maintained that the Alvarez murders were sanctioned by the government. Jimmy Hughes is an interesting character. He, we've we know a lot about that world and and we have a pretty detailed timeline of like confirmed what was happening what and listening to jimmy hughes's full confessions and explanations of what happened is so compelling um and you know there's parts where it's like it goes pretty off the rails but I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm getting myself into I'm digging myself into a hole talking about stuff we didn't actually include in the show. But Zach background on Jimmy Hughes. So so um, as we talk about in the show um, for many years, decades, there was a allegation, I think, going around that Jimmy Hughes had been involved with Fred Alvarez's murder. And um, that's what a, a, the, the latest detective who had investigated this a guy named John Powers. Um, when he opened up the case, reopened it as a cold case in 2007 or so, um, he was looking into Jimmy Hughes. Um, and coincidentally, I should say, like, we traced many different crimes where the murders, where the investigation seems to be cut off from a higher level than the local law enforcement that's dealing with it. And that was a similar case in, in the in the latest triple homicide investigation by the Riverside County Sheriff's uh, Department. Um, so Jimmy Hughes originally was a mall security guard in the area who had a background and he was in the military before that. He claimed that he was special forces, although I'm not sure that that's true. Um, the, the police officer's not sure that's true either, the detective John Powers. Um, and, or maybe he just said it's not true at all. Um, but he was he was almost like one of these prototypical um uh what's that magazine the uh soldier of fortune fortune kind of guys right mm -hmm. he just loved um shooting guns carrying guns walking Rowling around around at night and like all black you know, know shooting not like shooting guns out of his car and things like that we've heard a lot of like wild stories about jimmy 
Um, he was a he was a combat fanboy. He sounds um, like a, a Quaker. Uh, was it Quaker? <laughs> They're usually pretty peaceful. <laughs> He's just, just a being, choir. Being a little facetious, I can't help myself. So, right. So, so Jimmy, I mean, you could really make a whole movie about Jimmy because it's like he he actually grew up um speaking spanish so he was a logical person i guess uh to be interfacing with these n- contra leaders who end up on the reservation trying to buy weapons from john philip nichols and his operation out there with Wa- with wackenhut and jimmy hughes this combat fanboy is explaining oh yeah we've got you know we can do these night vision goggles we can do you know uh, semi-automatic and automatic weapons, all kinds of different things. Um, and he gets, I he's like he, the translator for these guys, like the translator, but he, I think he's just excited to be in the middle of this whole thing. And, um, and there was an, there was a problem, which was that Fred Alvarez, the tribal, um, one of the, you know, junior tribal leaders didn't want, this operation happening anymore. And so, like you said, he, he found documents that supported, I mean, he was also concerned that Nichols was stealing money from the tribe, from the casino that they had started out there. It just seemed like it was a, it was like a cat in the hat situation. Like they invited this guy Nichols in and he's causing all these problems. Fred wants him gone. And then Jimmy, Jimmy Hughes, I will say, um, he admitted on the record to having been hired to take five thousand dollars to somebody to murder Fred, that was what he would admit to on the record. But and, he uh, also- Detective Powers had him. He was in Central America at a certain point, and then Detective Powers had him extradited from Central America to face well, murder. Charges. Yeah, he had become a preacher down in um, Guatemala. Kind of out with John Philip Nichols after the murders, I think that he was pissed off that he wasn't fully paid. Um, <laughs> and they had a falling out and he thought that John Philip Nichols had put a hit out on him. And so he fled, did the John Philip, Philip Nichols, ha- uh, certified handbook where you become a religious leader. And he's now in, um, where is he? Guatemala now? I, I think he's in Guatemala. There is. I, Guatemala. Sorry. I forgot which is one. It, but... No, he's in Honduras. I get it. Honduras. Um, and he's a preacher down there now. He has a kind it's of a like, mission, an orphanage, and a. And he has all these kids that that are working for him, um, or that he's helping out, quote unquote. I mean, we haven't been down there to talk to him about it or just check on the five hundred one C status of his nonprofit, right? But he would come back to the United States and he would do lectures, and these lectures are pretty amazing because they're it's this story he's telling about going from hitman to holy man that's his whole kind of like redemption narrative it's like i and he has this one very specific story about like i was asked to kill a guy that i really liked and i went over there and i i didn't know if i could do it and, and I his just, friends were over and it was it, nighttime and, and and i realized at that moment and then he goes on this whole thing about how that led to him realizing that god had love for him and that he needed to get out of the business and he that's his religious awakening um so he's going on a tour doing this and and actually uh one of the victims the two of the victims fred's son and 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 ralph boger's uh daughter uh rachel um went to one of these meetings and recorded him doing his lecture and then confronted him afterwards and and rachel the daughter of ralph boger who was shot in the desert at Fred, fred's house uh confronts him at this meeting and she was posting these videos on youtube in real time I and mean, we don't even go this into the documentary it's its own side crazy story you know um and she confronts him and he he's like it's so fascinating i mean he he's what he says actually makes a lot of sense he's like my past is my past like what you're doing is dangerous. You're dealing with dangerous people. You don't know what you're doing. You're putting on YouTube. Like you need to be careful because the people you're messing with, like you, you have, you have kids. Yeah. You, you have, you, you, you're, they're going to be li- missing their mother. What are you going to ha- say when you're dead? You, that kind of thing. And then he says, screw the, pol-. he says something like screw the police, screw the FBI, screw all these people. And and he's, he's railing against the FBI, but it, it seems like, 
he felt like he was kind of messed around with by the FBI and by John Nichols and by the maybe the mafia and, and, and organized crime, all the stew of people who were connected in his mind to the reservation that kind of screwed him over um, after the homicide. Uh, so whatever, that was a whole bag of worms about Jimmy Hughes, a, a absolutely fascinating character who got tangled up in John Philip Nichols web out there. So he cops to the murders and then he's extradited, but then the charges are kind of mysteriously dropped against him. He never fully admitted to the murders, but the circumstantial evidence and, and people who had talked to him around that time, he had allegedly ad admitted that he had killed Fred. Or, and, and, and John Powers had developed uh, sources who corroborated it um, because of weird stuff involving the... Uh, well, actually, it had to be taken from the DA to the state level prosecutor because Jimmy Hughes's cousin was a was a, an attorney at the district attorney's office. So they had to go up a level. And um, that that prosecutor uh, burned a, co a confidential source of John Powers is somehow I can't remember exactly all the details and then ultimately uh decided to uh let jimmy go saying that it didn't have enough evidence and it was all very weird i it, is it true that the fbi had come in and talked to jimmy right before that i think what happened was that you know what i, I guess where i was trying to go with one of these stories but i went completely off track was that jimmy hughes was in a lecture in florida and john powers found out that he was in the states and he flew down to florida took jimmy off of the plane uh, with maybe the U.S. Marshals or local law enforcement, had him extradited back to Indio, back to Riverside County at least, to stand trial. Jimmy Hughes st was st stayed in prison or in jail for about a year, awaiting trial. Obvious flight risk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> while they while they were you know finishing gathering their case, um, and then the prosecutor right before they're they're at a pretrial hearing, right right before they're going to go to trial. And the prosecutor called John Powers, the uh, lead investigator on the case, and said, hey, man, we're dropping the case. Like, there's just not enough evidence. You know, <laughs> and John Powers is like, not enough evidence. I got a slam dunk case here. What are you talking about? Like, what new? He's like, oh, we have new evidence that's come out. And he's that's like, it, that debunks all of it, that they didn't tell the lead investigator what it was. And so the next day they go in front of the and they started accusing John Powers of having um, uh done some sort of malfeasance it was just it just to our view seemed like total bullshit um also and... in 19 so that the uh, alvarez triple homicide was in 1981 then there was a uh, a sting operation in 1985 that caught john philip nichols hiring people to kill some other people totally unrelated non-tribal members some local Ne'er do wells sure. that he drug dealers that he didn't like. Then in 2017, it came out that some cigarette butts from a crime scene in 1981 were connected to a, another homicide that this one successful that John Philip Nichols had hired. Um, you know, a guy, a local um, golf cart salesman that was uh, flirting with his girlfriend, you know. So He's willing to after he did his time in prison for the the sting attempted homicide. He's still willing to hire people to kill people over a girl, you know. And then you're wondering, yeah, did uh, he have, was he concerned about uh, Fred Alvarez? I don't know. Also, Wait, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. John Philip Nichols, to our view, got into a nasty habit, and we think that it probably traces back, likely to his time before Cabazon, of consolidating power in organizations like Cabazon. And when things go wrong, it seems like the obvious solution for him was to hire people to murder his enemies. <laughs> and As just... Bobby, his son says his dad was old school. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, when he Maca got Machiavelli would have been impressed. Yeah. Uh, um, in, in fact, when he got in trouble, I mean, in 1985 for the for the uh, uh solicitation of murder charges where he h accidentally hired an informant he told them hey if this goes well i've got more work for you in south america and uh, there were five murders i believe 
that he was he, he wanted arranged. Yeah, he 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 tried to arrange uh, uh five five murders, and he was talking to an informant. I think that what's really interesting about this entire case is, and and it's like a you know paper that somebody could write about this eventually is the sort of relationships between local various levels of local and federal law enforcement and the uh problems between and intelligence and the sort of like problems and interconnectedness and rivalries between them and these stories that we go into in the octopus murders uh are about the intersections and the disagreements in some ways between all these different agencies and their informants and their informants well, yeah. you definitely don't want to hit on John Nichols' girlfriend. I mean, that's uh, I, think, I, I, I think that would be a self-evident truth. So I, he is. We, we, we got a, We got an amazing anecdote. We got to drop. I know what he's going to say. Go, go for it. Go for it. What we heard was that one of his defenses at his solicitation of murder trial, which he did go to jail for two years, uh, light time, I think, but two years in jail for it. One of his defenses was this girl couldn't possibly be my girlfriend because I'm impotent. And the reason I'm impotent is because terrorists smashed my penis when I was in South America. So huh. That's a, that's it. I would just a typical Coca-Cola bottling plant manager. Hey, I'm just a religious guy, you know, terrorists. <laughs> it's, yeah. So now uh, Nichols is actually, I think he, he was ultimately didn't the uh, California deputy, uh, attorney general kind of intervene and and get him out of prison early is that was that how that went the attorney general's office yeah went to john powers the, the detective the, and they were the ones who said uh new evidence has come out and they uh took it to the court said uh we've decided to change our minds and the next day or that day i can't remember they uh put jimmy hughes take him to the airport and let him go da back down to um, Central America. So he's and there. Now we enter another interesting character enters the story, Michael Riconosciuto. Now he tells Danny Casalero that intelligence is working on different projects at the Cabazon Indian Reservation. Casalero wrote that Nichols brought an quote unquote, an army of sociopathic creatures to the reservation that included military personnel, CIA, Contras, and of course, Michael Reconosciuto. And Reconosciuto says that he was brought to the reservation to modify the Promise software, which had been ripped off from Bill Hamilton. Reconosciuto was a prodigy and his dad is part of some murky intelligence milieu. You guys want to fill that out a little bit? Yeah, um, that's how you connect the Cabazon Reservation to Inslaw and Promise through Michael Reconosciuto, who claims that it was there as working as a research director for the Cabazon Wagonut Joint Venture, which he was, that one of his assignments was to put a backdoor into this Promise software that would then be sold to... Uh, intelligence agencies of foreign governments through third parties uh, in order to uh, for the U.S. intelligence to access the databases that these uh, other foreign governments were using. Um, really hard to, we found, prove that allegation um, specifically regarding Promise and Cabazon. Um, and what what basically what what in Danny's timeline you know, it's at some point he drops, he, he's talking to Michael Riconosciuto and looking at Cabazon and he appears to drop his interest in promise altogether and just make a one pitch for a book called Behold a Pale Horse, which I think was about a year before the other b book came out. Um, that's just focused on, on Cabazon. Um, Anyways, uh, he that's just, that's just to say that Danny got super intrigued into and fascinated by what was going on out there. Um, that also, you know, connects to it. One of the financiers of the weapons uh, development project um, was a drug manufacturer in San Francisco, or a drug manufacturer and wholesaler named Paul Marasca, who was Michael's business partner in some 
various business dealings that they had in the Bay Area. Um, the uh, the their company was founded in Cabazon. Um, the charter was drawn up by the attorney for the Cabazon Indians. Um, and Paul Maraska, six months after Fred Alvarez was murdered, Paul Maraska was um, tortured and murdered, and all of his um, Swiss bank accounts uh, dried up. The drugs that he'd stashed in Nevada were gone. Um, his planes disappeared. Uh, you know, clearly the person that was torturing him got a access to his, you know, Swiss bank accounts and his, you know, hidden stuff. His in the in the interim, in the interim in 1991, Rakana Shuda, Shuda files an affidavit uh, before the House Judiciary Committee investigating Inslaw and the government. And he says that Promise software was stolen and that he modified it. Yeah. And within a week of filing that affidavit, Rakanashuda was busted for the manufacture of crystal meth and LSD by the DEA and given 30 years in prison. Michael listens to a lot of these podcasts and he likes to get all the details right, as anyone should. LSD was not, it was just methamphetamine precursors oh, okay. in, in that 1991 arrest. There was a 1972 arrest where LSD and PCP, I think, were certainly PCP was uh, what, what he was working on. And allegedly. allegedly. Well, he got arrested and convicted, so I don't think you have to say alleged. At that point. It was the DEA, and he got 30 years. I mean, within a week of filing that affidavit saying the yeah, government had ripped off. So I, I think that there might be bizarre. some personality there. Yeah, it's it's certainly weird. I think it's definitely to Danny when he's sitting there. Um, I think I think something really important to remember about this story when you watch it, especially in our documentary, is that none of these people were public figures. Now, I mean, we Christian and I treat them almost like they're they're yeah. celebrities celebrity characters because they seem so important to us um but people like michael uh, no nobody had heard of this guy in the you know mainstream world really um and he's just a source of danny's who's telling him that i modified the software i did it for um you know intelligence agencies and i did it with whack and hut out at the cabazon um reservation and then he files the affidavit, like you say, and eight days later, he's arrested in, in Washington State for um, for this drug bust. But <laughs> I think if you're in Danny's position, it's really easy to say like, oh, well, I'm talking to this source. Nobody knows about this guy. Suddenly he's filing this this this, you know, allegation against the government and the same department of the government, the Justice Department through the DEA arrests him, you know, and it's very easy to draw a line there a logical line i think for danny and i think michael reinforced this that this was retribution for him coming forward and spilling the beans on that the october surprise and his relationship with the october surprise the whack and organization and all these all these things that he had alleged um if you listen to anybody who was on the federal law enforcement side i mean we've talked to some of those people and uh, read quotes from them and they will just say what are you talking about? This dude was a major drug, you know, manufacturer. Like this is just hogwash, you know. But I think that um, I think that we show uh, in in the documentary that there's much more to Michael than just you know him being a drug dealer or something like that. What's interesting, the October surprise was people uh, emissaries from the Reagan administration told the Iranians to hold the hostages so it would look Carter look very weak when Carter squared off against Reagan. And we told them, or our government, or the emissaries said, we'll sell you arms really cheap because Iran was involved with a war against Iraq. And actually there, there was a major investigation into the October surprise. And believe it or not, our Congress said the October surprise didn't happen. But last March, the New York Times published an article saying that the October surprise did, in fact, happen. So Michael Riccanosciuto was right about the October surprise. I'm not. He was right that it happened. Yes. Um, 
he said he went to Iran with Earl Bryan um, to uh, help do the uh, wire transfer of the $40 million in illicit funds to sweeten the, the deal with the uh, Iranians that we were never, never able to uh, prove in any way. Um, Interesting because there's many different versions of how that story happened. And Bob Perry spent his better part of his career and was largely uh, excluded from journalism, mainstream journalism, for going too deep into this, um, trying to track down all these different tendrils. I think the October Surprise deserves some movie and that you get to see um, the um, possible ways the intelligence community is working, but also ways that the intelligence community is um, seeding all kinds of stories. So you never know what's real and what's not. And it's, it's, it's an in that's a, we talk about a hall of mirrors. I mean, just, just put it this way. The oh. campaign manager for Ronald Reagan was <laughs> William Casey, who then became the director of the central intelligence agency. His main assignment as campaign director was to have to do foreign negotiations for a former Republican of California who wanted to be the president of the United States. How many directors of CIA are lowly campaign managers ever also, in the history? Let's just throw one more little little thread in here while we're here, and we don't even get this in the documentary. William Casey, former OSS legend from the precursor of the CIA, um, was outside counsel to Wackenhut, which is the company that was out at Cabazon <laughs> with John Philip Nichols and Michael Reconosciuto. So it's a nest of all of this sort of, if, if you want to see it in a certain way, it's, it's, it's really, a, our story is really about the privatization of, or, and the porousness between the, 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 the um, government intelligence and the private intelligence and private military industrial complex. What's interesting about William Casey, he shows up in a book that I co-authored confessions of a DC madam. Henry Vincent ran a, a gay escort service. And I guess from I, this comes from a number of uh, prostitutes. William Casey would have the gay prostitutes like anoint him in oil, and he had erectile dysfunction. Um, and this was before Viagra, so I don't know how he resolved it. But um, yeah, he was. So it, it's kind of weird to hire a gay prostitute and then have him rub oil all over your body and have erectile dysfunction i just uh i always thought that that was kind of interesting in that book this is just a great photo of uh or drawing of casey so people can know what he looks like very interesting character in casey uh you know i i i, I haven't read that part of your book about casey and and all, uh, who knows i don't i don't know he's such a complicated what guy. An, that that madame that what it was what an amazing source you know that's really henry <laughs> that telling you, of... if that guy's telling you the truth well the thing about henry the the... he was kind of like in a position like michael reconosciuto he was the man who knew too much and he had to go to prison for a long time and I guess my, like how can all of these people be doing all this gay escort stuff are, is there are there enough re gay republicans in the world to fill the volume of orders that are that are coming through how, how 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 do you see it that way nick um well he certainly didn't have a cash flow problem so obviously it was a very lucrative business henry was a brilliant guy yeah. he uh he was a he's a mortician by by trade and he comes from this very religious family in west virginia where people have handle snakes and things like that and um on a whim, he bought this gay escort service from a guy dying from AIDS for like $10,000. And then he went through the yellow pages and escort services are generally fly by night operations. So they don't pay their phone bill. And then he called up all these escort services and they, the, the number was disconnected. So Henry called the phone company and said, I will pay the arrears on that number if you give me the number. So suddenly he went from having one escort agency to many of them, <laughs> like half the ones in the yellow pages. So, um, and he, uh, 
he became the man who knew too much. He was, he saw the CIA people compromise um, other people. I mean, he, he knew a lot. And the government said to him, Henry, he was indicted on, you know, the guy was just running gay escort service and he was indicted on uh, 41 RICO counts. And the government said to Henry, Henry, you know, you've seen a lot and uh, you could cause us some embarrassment, but we're going to make sure that you do 295 years in prison if you talk. Now, if you don't talk, we'll give you a pretty good deal. Five years. So uh, Henry opted not to talk at that point. But then talk to you. He did eventually want to write a book. He was really tired of his name being slandered. And uh, so he wanted to write a book. 